Hi, welcome to Tessera's Nerf Room. So today I'm going to be doing something that I have been wanting to do for quite a while, and that is ranking my top five favorite and least favorite series, or universally spoken, the top five best and worst series that Nerf have ever put out. But the thing is, that is very subjective, so I'm going to make a couple rules. First is that the series has to correlate to today's standards. So N-Strike cannot be number one just because it was very revolutionary, because nowadays the N-Strike blasters just aren't very good anymore, and this video is more meant to be like educational purposes only to explain what I think the best and worst series are that Nerf have put out. And the second rule is subseries are not allowed. So Zombie Strike Bio Squad would just be fit in with the rest of Zombie Strike. And you get the point with every other series. Elite, Accu Strike, same basic principle. So with that said, first of all, I want to give a couple honorable mentions and dishonorable mentions. For honorable mentions, I'm bringing up the Mega series, the End Strike series, and the Dart Tag series. Mega is a series that I personally really love. I love almost every single Mega Blaster just for the sole reason that they shoot ridiculously big darts for absolutely no reason. There is no practical usage for using a Mega Blaster unless your game type specifically overvalues them, and they are just big dumb fun. But that is just my personal opinion. Other people might not feel the same way, so I'm not going to include it as a part on the list. As for End Strike and Dart Tag, well, I'd have to include them somewhere in this video, even though they don't fit into the criteria that I set these series to go into for them to make the list. I'm basically just putting them here to say that, yeah, both of those are absolutely fantastic. I just can't put them on the list because they aren't up to date anymore. As for dishonorable mentions, there are only two. The Nerf Limited series and the Rebel series. Rebel was mainly targeted towards a uh, smaller audience, which was kind of an issue for a lot of nerfers, but that's not why it's a dishonorable mention. Mainly because most of, if not all of the blasters in the entire lineup were gimmicky and not practical in the slightest. Rebel was mostly, mostly made up of bows, I don't know why I can't speak, Rebel was mostly made up of bows and not very good ones, usually they had some weird trick to where like you had to prime it in a weird way to get it to fire one dart and then you'd have to prime it again and fire it again. Then there was just stupid stuff like the Arrow Revolution bow which we do not need to talk about again. As for Nerf Limited, the reason why it is not making the list even though most people say that Limited is a bad series is because it it tethers to a very small audience, and there are quite a few hits in the limited series. Primarily, the Needler and Gallarhorn Blasters, as well as, if you really want to consider, the Alien's Pulse Rifle, even though that has a multitude of problems. The blasters in that series are first and foremost props, not meant to be used as nerf blasters that much, Primarily, the Needler is a prop. You are not supposed to use that thing as a blaster. The Gallarhorn, though, is actually doing something really interesting, and I unironically love using it as a blaster. As for most of the other ones, it's kind of a hit or miss situation. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. We don't need to talk about the Mandalorian rifle or the AR Goosebumps again. And I just generally think that Limited is a very strange series that tethers to a very, very small specific audience, which is why there are some people who absolutely praise it as like the best series ever, but the majority of people, no matter what will happen with the series, will still continue to say that it is one of the worst. So now with all that hullabaloo out of the way, let's get started with the number fives. First, the best. At the number 5 spot on the best side is the Nerf Doomland series, and this is quite a hot take because a lot of people claim that this is quite a bad series and that it deserved to die as fast as it did. I could not stand further from that statement. I personally believe that Doomlands is actually a very good series that was killed off too soon primarily because of the release of the Double Dealer and how horrific that launch was. The Double Dealer, while being a very interesting concept, did not work properly. It jammed. A lot. It jammed all the time and was a colossal disaster that pretty much killed the rest of the series from that point forwards. Nerf tried again one year later, they released The Negotiator and The Judge, neither of which sold very well at all, and then one year later they only released one more, The Holdout, and I 
don't even know if that thing sold any units in the first place. The only two blasters that people seem to remember from the Doomland series at all are the Desolator and the Vagabond. Neither of which I have conveniently, but the Desolator was just a mediocre strife reskin, but it was a flywheel blaster, which is probably why it was so widely remembered, and the Vagabond was just plain ridiculous. It was like a strong arm rough cut had a baby. But the sad truth is, I really like Doomland's blasters. I think that they're super cool. A sort of futuristic cyberpunk western style of blaster, half of them were hammer actions and the other half just had really cool or really interesting gimmicks like the extended cylinder on the Vagabond or the double dealer drum cylinder mechanism magazine things that the double dealer used or the judge. As for the number five worst, that has to go to the Dino Squad series. A series with only one good blaster. Seriously, one of them is good. And that is the Rex Rampage. And even then, I wouldn't necessarily call it good as I would subpar at best and just mediocre to bad at worst. Dino Squad, to put it very simply, is the same blaster that you have seen five times re-released already, but packaged up in an even clunkier, harder to store shell that looks almost sort of kind of cool, and priced at almost double what the original's retail price was. Don't believe me? Eagle Point, $20. Armor Strike, originally $50, then lowered to $40 then lowered to 30. Both of them functionally identical, with the armor strike just being bigger and having worse ergonomics and zero attachment points that you could ever find any use for. Oh, you, you, still, you still don't believe me? Commander, $13. Raptor Slash, $20. Functionally identical, Raptor Slash has no attachment points at all. The only blaster in the whole series that was almost kind of interesting was the Tricera Blast, and even then, that was just a tri-break, or like a hammer action triad with an annoying brake barrel mechanism that you would have to be really in the mood for to actually like. And when I remember how similar it is to the Sledgefire, and how I originally thought that it was going to be the rebirth of the Sledgefire, which- <laughs> Yeah! kind of hold a vendetta against that stupid nugget. But I guess you could say that these blasters aren't hurting anything aside from Walmart shelf space. There are less good blasters on the shelves in replacement for terrible Dino Squad ones. Keep in mind, the Rex Rampage is not sold at Walmart anymore. So even if you do want to get a Rex Rampage from the Dino Squad series, you would be out of luck unless you go on Amazon or you happen to find one at Ollie's. I went to Ollie's and they had about 500 of them. Not even joking, there were shelves upon shelves upon shelves upon sh At the number four on the good side is Elite 2.0. Allow me to explain myself for a moment. Yes, we know how Elite 2.0 launched. Clips, glue, solvent welds, cheaper plastic, cheaper internals, just bad, 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 bad. But ironically, most of those release Elite 2.0 blasters, you can't find in stores anymore. Do you know what you do find from Elite 2.0? The Eagle Point, the Moto Blitz, the Double Punch, and the Storm Charge. And sometimes, the Trailblazer. All five of those are really McFrickin' good. The Trailblazer is kind of hit or miss because the grip is tiny, so if you have tiny hands you'll probably like it, but otherwise, eh, I would just modify a hammer shot if I were you. But for the other ones, Elite 2.0 is actually pretty good. None of those blasters are clipped together, and they all work very, very well. Granted, the Eagle Point is kind of mediocre, and the uh, Storm Charge is kind of a titanic pain in the ass to open because of the two clipped together pieces on the grip. But other than that, yeah, the blasters are just fine. The Double Punch is magnificent. That blaster alone put Elite 2.0 in my list of best series, and I'm being serious. That is how good the double punch is. It is so good that it breached my barrier for Elite 2.0 being a bad series, and I said, nope, boom, open it, not bad anymore, it's good. 
And I think that the series is just going to get better and better and better and better and better from time going on. Elite 2.0 is not just going to magically disappear and go back to being Elite 1.0. That would just be stupid. But Hasbro knows how to make a good blaster in the double punch. And I wholeheartedly believe that Elite 2.0 is going to get way better from this point forwards. And that is why it is at number four on the best list. Number four on the, the worst list just confuses me. Gelfire is a series that I don't know how to feel about at the moment. The original launch of Gelfire looked super cool and super promising, being like high performance gel blasters, and then the Mythic ended up being an overpriced disappointment for most people. And then they released the Legion and like the entire nerf community collectively did the, the like this face and were like, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is stupid. And then they released the clicky dual wield guns. And then they released the ghost. And then they released the shotgun one. I think it's called the raid. And all three of those are actually really interesting for none of the reasons that other gel blasters are interesting for. These blasters are interesting, unique, and original for gel blasters. Granted, they are pretty basic for nerf blaster standards being just like an ordinary shotgun, an ordinary sniper rifle, and an ordinary little pistol, but actually even then, nerf hasn't made a good bolt action sniper in a long time, they've never done a 5 shot shotgun, and it's been a very long time since they've made any semi-automatic trigger press blasters, the last one being the nail biter. If you've noticed, that thing's magically appeared in my collection. A review is coming soon. Very soon. But even with these good offerings, I can't help but ask the question, is this what gel blasting needed or wanted? Gel blasting is very competitive, like paintball. Gimmicky interesting blasters like this should have been reserved for the Elite 2.0 series, but instead they're shooting gel balls which are very proprietary and one use. You use them once, you can't use them again. So it's pretty much one of those things where you have to keep buying into their brand in order to supply your usage of gel blasters, not to mention you can only use them outside and you have to wait like four hours before you can use your blaster at all after you buy it, just so that the gel balls can actually hydrate. But as it stands now, it is very hard to determine what gel fire is, but I do think that it is one of the most mediocre and botched beginnings to any nerf series out there. They started like saying like, oh no, we're gonna be the new competitor, and then they just like randomly turned and switched a different direction for absolutely no reason other than the fact that they knew the mythic was not selling well. Granted, I'm happy with my Mythic, but that's because I'm not competitive with Gel Ball Blasters, and I just really don't care. So getting a Mythic was not the end of the world for me, and I'm actually pretty glad that I got one, because I like mine a lot. But yeah, the Gel Fire series. Let's go to number three. On the number three side of the best side, we have N-Strike Elite, a series that began like in 2012, I believe, which is absolutely ridiculous ridiculously long ago, that's more than 10 years ago, and survived for a very, very long time. Elite blasters still hold up to this day, especially the first ones that were released, like the Raven, the Strife, and the Rough Cut, okay, not the Battle Camo one, but the Rough Cut, stuff like that, which has that original kind of elite grip, you know which one I'm talking about. You see that grip, you know the blaster's gonna be good. The grip itself is iconic. It's the one that is on the strife. If you see it, like, you know right away the blaster's gonna be good if you see that grip on it. And believe me, those blasters are good. The strife, the rapid strike, and the rough cut, and the raven, all four of those having that same grip design, and all, all four of those managed to be some of the most well-known and iconic blasters in nerf history, right up there next to the retaliator slash the recon. Oh, and did I mention the Retaliators in this series as well? Oh, and did I mention that the Strong Arm is in that series as well? Yeah, Elite was a fantastic series, not to mention that it introduced AccuStrike, which for some reason was a gimmick and did not become the standard. Hasbro, what were you thinking? But Elite is well known for a variety of reasons. There were very few misses in the Elite series, 
almost all the way up until the end of their of their runtime. Granted, the last generation of Elite was really hit or miss. There were quite a few misses on like the last generation when they upped the design and changed it around and kind of started recreating older blasters. But still, I think that Elite is a very, very good series and very hard to top. Number three, I almost don't want to say because I know that there are people who really like this series, but hear me out. A lot of people have asked me what I think of the Zombie Strike series, and considering the fact that it's at number three, you can probably tell what I think about this series. I don't like this series at all. Let me quickly explain what happened with Zombie Strike to why I don't like it in the slightest. Because if you're thinking about blasters like the Hammer Shot and the Sledge Fire and the Sling Fire, oh no, those are fantastic. All three of those blasters are very well done, very nicely executed, and fit the Zombie Strike theme. What I don't like is when Hasbro retconned the original idea for, Z for Zombie Strike being futuristic and western, mainly when they made the Doomland series, and instead just started dumping all of their worst gimmicks into Zombie Strike. Don't believe me? Do you remember the Dominator, the Rip Chain, the Brain Saw, the Rev Reaper, the Nail Biter, the Abolisher, the Eraser, the Ghoul Grinder, the Contractor, the Revoltinator, the Outbreaker Bow, the Crossfire Bow, or God forbid the Quadrot? While some people can make arguments for things like the Revoltinator for being a Stripe reskin, the Quadrot for being good and efficient for a 4-shot Smart AR Blaster, and the Nail Biter for introducing something new, it is very, very hard to find someone who will try to defend any of the other blasters I just listed. They all have mediocre to bad performance, stupid unlikable gimmicks that people just don't need or want. Nobody asked for these gimmicks, nobody wanted these gimmicks, and yet they were haphazardly dumped into the Zombie Strike series over and over and over and over and over and over again until eventually they stopped making blasters with the Zombie Strike name on it after Oh, how convenient. The Ghoul Grinder. One of the most useless blasters I have ever seen. Hasbro's decision to retcon the original idea for Zombie Strike was its ultimate downfall. The Brain Saw, I will admit, was a pretty good idea, but it was executed in the worst way possible, where it could have been a, uh, a rough cut reskinned into a chainsaw with a big foam chainsaw blade going over the front so that you could use it as a rough cut and then chainsaw people with it as a melee. Instead, they went for the worst possible option, making it a terrible 8-shot smart AR blaster with a foam spinning saw blade at the end of a plastic chainsaw. I could make a whole video talking about how disappointing Zombie Strike became after the initial launch and after like just a couple years after the launch and how Hasbro completely killed it, but that will be for another day. For right now, we gotta get to the number two spot. I think that Nerf Rival is a series that was ahead of its time by a long shot and people were just blown away when it actually came out. It was single-handedly the coolest, most high-performance thing that Nerf had ever done at its release, and it stayed like that for a very, very long time. Up until Nerf Hyper came out, and even then that was kind of botched, and I will get into that another day. Rival was a pretty basic concept. Basically, paintball shooters at 100 FPS with foam rounds that you could dump either into a hopper or into a magazine or just feeding them directly into the blaster, and almost every single rival blaster released was good up until 2020, that faithful year. Yeah, 2020 started introducing Nuggets into the Rival series, and that's kind of where the Rival series started dying off. Ever since then, the Rival series has been very slowly dragging behind everything else, very few releases are actually good, like the pilot is a very good release, and, and that's about it. But if you look before that, the worst received rival blaster up until that point was the Atlas, and even then, that blaster is still, by all things considered, really good. 
the blasters felt more premium than anything else Nerf had been making. They felt more competitive. They felt more robust. They were larger. They were heavier. They had bigger, comfier grips. They had heavier primes. They felt like they had a tons of power in them. I don't know what I was saying. A tons of power? I, was, I meant to say they had tons of power and a ton of power. I hate when my brain does that. Admit that you hate when your brain does that too because you know it does that a lot. But almost every blaster was a hit and was doing something new. Remember when the Chaos came out and you were able to shoot 40 rival rounds really fast, full lotto at 100 FPS? And then do you remember when the Nemesis came out and Hasbro was like, Alright, we did it good last time. Let's take everything about it and make it 50 times better. And then the Prometheus came out and it was clear that everybody in the rival department at the Hasbro headquarters was just having way too much fun with this series. And that just carried on when the Perseus was released. Rival was an awesome series. I think that everybody should know how good Rival was. But unfortunately, we've got to talk about the number two spot on the worst side now. Ask yourself a question. How do you take something mediocre to bad and you make it worse? The answer is the Hasbro brand tie-in series. There are three of them in this category. Fortnite, which is the biggest, Minecraft, which is the smallest, and Roblox, which is kind of in the middle, and all three of them are equally horrible. Now, Fortnite was okay at the start. The original ARL was a fine blaster. The tactical shotgun is actually a pretty good blaster. I have it right now, and it's actually very fun. And every once in a while, there is a release in the Fortnite series that actually surprises the mainstream audience with how good it is, such as the Legendary Tech or that Bolt Action one, the, the orange one that came out last year. But I can't say anything for any of the other ones in the Fortnite line or the Roblox or Minecraft lines. All three of these series have been haphazardly shoehorned in to try and please the audience that wants like nerf limited blasters from these games even though nerf doesn't want to make limited blasters for these games and there wouldn't be any reason to because they're just not big enough to become like nerf limited things. I mean that's not really the right word but you get what I'm saying I hope. I, as a Minecraft player, was especially insulted when I saw the original pictures of the Pillager's crossbow because it's just a big slab of white plastic underneath a big slab of orange plastic and that's it. No texture, no details, absolutely not faithful at all to the original source material in any possible reasonable way whatsoever. It doesn't even look like a Minecraft blaster. It looks like one of those off-brand crappy pixel art blasters that you see like at the side of swap meets that people are selling for a dollar and they're just made of foam. The best blaster in the Minecraft series is the Sabre Wing, which is a very mediocre subpar flywheeler at best and a pretty bad one at worst. And as for Roblox, I really don't know. Maybe the Strife reskin just because it's a Strife reskin, or maybe the, the web launcher thing just because it is the most compact mega, me, mega missile launcher thing out there. I just don't know. They both suck. All these series sucks. There's no reason to invest in a Fortnite, Minecraft, or Roblox blaster unless you so desperately want the cosmetics of those blasters because I can guarantee Every single blaster you're looking at has been made in the past better in just about every single possible reasonable way. And somehow there is still a series that I think is worse than these three series combined. And but first we need to talk about what I think is the best series that Nerf has ever made. I gotta tell y'all, I didn't know how to think about this series at the start, but it quickly became my favorite to this very day. I'm of course talking about the Nerf Modulus series. I think that Modulus is magnificent in every single way. Hasbro said, oh, you like the attachments we've made for blasters? Alrighty, why not make a series all about the attachments? And that was it. Granted, there were some nuggets released in the series like the Battle Scout and the Ion Fire to an extent, though if you mod the Ion Fire it actually can get pretty good. But then at the same time, they use the Modulus series as an excuse to bring back the Strife, the Demolisher, and the Long Strike. Yes, the Long Strike. 
They also introduced things like the Recon Mark III and Mark II, which are actually pretty good recreations of the original Retaliator and serve as a sort of new generation for those blasters. And on the other side of the spectrum, they made nuggets like the Regulator, blasters that people are still wanting to get to this day because it's just so cool. As I just said, almost every single blaster in the Modulus series was a hit. The blasters not only looked very cool, but were doing fun things as well. Especially because the Modulus series also introduced the Ghost Ops sub-series, which was kind of short-lived, but mainly it brought us the Evader, which is a very interesting strife reskin that we haven't really seen anything like before. When I saw that Nerf stopped making bespoke modulus blasters back in late 2020, I was honestly devastated because this was quite honestly the best series I have ever seen out of Hasbro. It tops everything else. And yet there is one that is so bad that it literally made me actually cry. And this is a true story you can probably guess what the number one worst series is, and I'm going to explain why I think it is the absolute worst. Never in my entire life have I seen more wasted potential and retconned ideas than the supposed ultimate dart blasters in the Nerf Ultra series that we were promised in 2019. This was a series that put itself on such a high pedestal that anything underneath perfection would have been disappointing, and everybody, including the people working at Hasbro, knew that. And the release of the Nerf Ultra 1 was so bad and so broken that they desperately tried in many ways to make up for it, and you could see the ungodly desperation coming out of that company attempting to push this train wreck of a series. They hosted gargantuan events all about it. They hosted TV promos about it. They made a video game all about it, that being Nerf Legends. That game was meant to promote the Ultra series as seen through Ultra box art being placed all around inside the game via the use of banners and blasters that you can buy. They made the boxes for these blasters as flashy and enticing as humanly possible, hoping in vain that somebody would fall for the scam that was an Ultra Blaster being better than a standard Nerf Blaster. Promises of pinpoint accuracy, shooting up to 120 feet, which essentially translates to 150 FPS, or somewhere around that ballpark in order to actually get a dart to fly up to 120 feet. These are things that people would have at least hoped that they could trust Hasbro to actually live up to, and none of these expectations were lived up to at all, to the point where when you took your brand new beautiful gold Ultra 1 out of the box and flipped it over, they even retconned putting the Ultra logo in gold on both sides. And granted, I understand the concept of not painting both sides, Nerf has been doing that for years, but when the most flashy and enticing element of the entire blaster is retconned on the other side of the same blaster, not even further down the line, like when they chose to make the N-Strike Elite logo black instead of making it white just so that it could stay with the uh, original shade of the plastic, that was fine because it just worked. But Ultra went above and beyond to show how nice their blasters look, and they only looked even remotely good from one side. The Ultra Darts out of the box, this brand new bespoke ammo type that was not compatible with anything else, half of them snapped in half right out of the box when you took them out with the Ultra 1. Granted, the refill packs didn't do that, but that just led to even more confusing questions like how did this happen in the first place? After the Ultra 1, Nerf just shoehorned in a whole bunch of other blasters. The 2, 3, 4, and 5, which are their actual names. What a name for a blaster. Imagine being called 3. The Ultra 5 was horrible. The Ultra 3 was horrible. The Ultra 2 was actually the only one that was received well, and the Ultra 4 was received mediocre at best and subpar at worst. 
And after that, Hasbro just stopped caring about the series altogether. They started making weirder gimmicky blasters, like the Select, which had two magazines that switched side to side for some reason, and the Amp, which was a mediocre strife reskin that always shot to the right. Always. But the saddest part about everything is that right at the end, Ultra started to almost get good. The Ultra Strike, and the Focus, and the Speed. All three of those blasters. I mean, granted, the Focus was just a re recreation of the Amp, but with a stock, so that one doesn't really count. But mainly the Strike and the Speed. The Strike was a an honest attempt to make a good semi-automatic flywheeler, and the Speed, while having proprietary magazines, was Hasbro's best attempt at a new fully automatic flywheel blaster. And the speed, when looked at all on its own, is theoretically the best blaster. It uses the best, most efficient magazines that you could use for an ultra blaster. It's got relatively decent to mid-tier performance. I mean, the performance isn't really what they're going for. And it has a very nice rate of fire. It's more of just like a 12 dart burst shotgun than anything else, like a big short range shotgun that just shoots 12 darts really fast. And to that, I say, that's actually a pretty cool idea, and I think that they did it relatively fine with the speed. But that does not excuse this series. Lots of false promises, lots of desperation, the real fall of Nerf as a hobby and as a brand. Not as a hobby, but Nerf as a brand from this point forwards, would never regain that trust again. Because never again could you look at a box that said Nerf on it and be able to believe everything that was said on the box just because of how horrifically bad the Ultra series was perceived. And the irony is that most of the Ultra Blasters are better than all of the other blasters that I've put at on the worst list. It's just because of how high of a pedestal Ultra was sat on top of to be delivered mediocre Elite Blasters unacceptable. Something that I don't think people will ever be able to forgive Hasbro for, even if they correct all their mistakes in the future. Because somewhere in the world, those blasters with the Ultra logos on them will still be in somebody's house. My house. I have the Ultra Blasters. Come get me. I'm not scared. But that's all I've got for today. Thank you for watching, and I leave your lists in the description. Tell me why you think that your list is better than mine. Well, actually, just explain your list. I would love to hear your opinions on what you think the best and worst Nerf series are. With that said, this has been Tester's Nerf Room. See ya.